Hey everybody, welcome back to the Financial Freedom Show. My name is Rob Berger. In today's episode, we're gonna take a look at an approach to investing that some refer to as VU and CHILL. VU, V-O-O, is just the ticker symbol for Vanguard's S&P 500 Index ETF. And the concept behind VU and CHILL is just, look, put your your equity investments in the S&P 500 and then just CHILL. And it's come up in, in response to the video I published yesterday, walking through my portfolio's performance in 2021. If you watch that video, you know that while I didn't quite uh, mirror the S&P 500, it came awfully close, and that's with a a really diversified portfolio that includes large caps, small caps, some value, emerging markets, international developed countries and REITs, as well as a few individual stocks. But a lot of folks commented and said, Rob, why are you working so hard, buddy? Just stick your money in an S&P 500 index fund, VU, and chill. And I gotta be honest with you, it's a valid argument. So the question is, why do I go to all the trouble? And uh, more importantly, what's right for you? Now, I'm going to walk through my thinking on this. My goal today is not to convince you that my way of investing is the best approach or even the approach you should take. But I do hope to, one, explain why I don't just invest in the S&P 500. And more importantly, give you some tools and, and just sort of ways to think about this so that you can make the best decision for you. And to start with, I want to go to the to the screen and we're looking at Portfolio Visualizer. And I want to show first why the, the VU and CHILL advocates, frankly, have a pretty strong case. So we're looking at Portfolio Visualizer and I've created two portfolios. One is US large cap, which I think is a good approximation of the S&P 500, that's Portfolio 1. And then Portfolio 2 is 50-50. I've, I've got 50% in US large cap, but then 50% in uh, international stocks. And if we if we analyze this portfolio, we see that it covers 35 years. So we've got, I think, a, a reasonably good time period to look at this. And when we come down here, just the US large cap, that's this first row, it kind of trounces uh, the, the portfolio that adds international stocks. It's 480,000 versus 266, assuming a lump sum investment at the start uh, for with 10 grand. Compound annual growth rate is noticeably higher. And look at the standard deviation. They're basically identical. And in fact, the max drawdown was actually worse when you had international stocks uh, by a few percentage points. So, I mean, boy, if this isn't a good case for VU and CHILL, I don't know what is. Now, it hasn't always been, you know, uh, an easy uh, ride. If we look at this sort of time lapse, if you will, the red line includes the international stocks. And we can see that in the early part of this time period, Having international stocks actually helped you. We, that portfolio was outperforming the U.S. large cap, and it did so into the 90s, uh, all the way up really into 95. But then after that, you know, uh, the S&P or the, or the large cap U.S. portfolio pulled away. It narrowed the, the, the gap uh, during the financial crisis. And even uh, there are even periods in here, say the first decade of this century, where international uh, international stock exposure would have actually outperformed, say, the S&P 500. But by and large, since the 80s, uh, just the S&P 500 or U.S. large cap would have outperformed for a really long period of time. And of course, over the last decade or so, it's really trounced uh, international. And when I went through my portfolio for 2021, frankly, international was the, the worst part of the portfolio. Now, that raises the question then, why not just VU and CHILL? And the first question I think we have to, to answer is, if we're gonna go with just an S&P 500, why are we going to do it? Now, that may seem like a silly question. We can say, well, Rob, you just looked at the history. We're going to <laughs> we're going to go with S&P 500 because the history tells us it's the way to go. And yes, we know that history doesn't always repeat itself. It's not a guarantee of the future, but we might add to that history, look, the U.S. has a robust economy. It's a very diverse economy, unlike Japan in the 80s, for example. Uh, a lot of uh, resources, uh, excellent uh, education, an excellent regulatory in- environment here in-, in the U.S. We have you know, an excellent free market. So there's this sort of narrative beyond just the history that says, you know, S&P 500 is the way to go. So then I think that raises a question for us. And that is, all right, fine, we're gonna stick with the US, but why the S&P 500? Is that, I mean, we like the US good, but if we're also gonna use some history, is the S&P 500 the best we can do? Well, let's take a look. We'll go back to our portfolio. 
and um, we're going to get rid of uh, international, but instead we're going to do um, small cap value. That's US, right? And so why not do small cap value? And we'll change the name up here, US small cap value. And let's analyze this and see how we do. Holy, holy cannoli. 1.8 million for US large cap, 7 million for US small cap value. Now this goes back further. We don't start at 86, we start at 72. But my goodness, clobbered the US large cap. And if we look here, again, in the early years it was neck and neck, but then after that, man, it just took off. We can look year by year, and there's no doubt going to be years uh, when US small cap does not outperform. That's been true, by the way, in the last few years. We look over to the right of this uh, uh, chart. But by and large, boy, US small cap value is pretty consistently um, uh, outperformed. Now, I think what some would say is, well, true, Rob, but I mean, diversity does matter. And small cap value is such, such a niche you know, kind of asset class, you know, I'm a little concerned about going that extreme. Well, how niche is it? Um, if we go back and we look at it, let's look at Vanguard small cap value in Morningstar. Here it is, it's V-S-I-A-X, I, uh, full disclosure, uh, I own this uh, fund, as I'm sure many of you do. And uh, if we look at the portfolio, how many companies are actually in this index? Wow, twice as many as the S&P 500. Are we sure this isn't diverse? Is that really an argument we can make? Hmm, I don't know, but all right, fine. Let's change it up a bit. And instead of small cap value, let's just do small cap. Change the name just so we don't get confused, or I should say so that I don't get confused. Uh, still, look, we didn't get 7 million, but boy, we still handily beat uh, the U.S. large cap, and if we come back to Morningstar, and let's look at Vanguard small cap index, that'll pull it up. Yep, here it is. And if we look at the portfolio, let's see how many equities are in this portfolio. Wow, 1,560. Uh, so three times as many as the S&P 500, and we could go even further. We could say, even if that level of diversity makes one uncomfortable, uh, what about U.S. mid-cap value? What if we go U.S. mid-cap value and U.S. small-cap value? I don't know. I didn't do this ahead of the video, so I don't actually know how this is going to come out. But we'll do 50-50. Wow. Absolutely clobbered. Again, it wasn't the 7 million if we had 100% in U.S. small-cap value, but still handily beats U.S. large-cap. Now, we know the U.S. small cap value, uh, the Vanguard Index Fund, has about 1,000 uh, 1, uh, companies. What about Vanguard mid-cap value? And I don't even know if they offer that, but we'll find out. Oh, they sure do. How many companies are in this uh, index fund? Remember, there was 1,000 in the U.S. small cap value. In the mid-cap value, 211. So we've just added another 20% in terms of number of equity positions. And the result is we've still trounced uh, the U.S. large cap portfolio. And so that raises sort of a bigger question, and that is, where do we stop? Where do we find our comfort zone between uh, the history of asset returns? And by the way, I was looking at set periods. We could have changed those periods or looked at, looked at rolling returns, and we could have found 10-year periods where the S&P 500 won out and where it got trounced. So in addition to, to relying on historical returns, but just beyond that, we also have to decide over what period of time do we want to pick because it could and often does influence the outcome. And so in, in my own investment approach, I've had to decide what level of diversification I am comfortable with. I do look at historical returns as one factor, but it's not, for me, the only factor. And the way I do it, at least try, try to do it mentally, is I ask myself this question. What portfolio would I be comfortable owning if I couldn't make any changes to it for 25 years? Let's say the market's just shut down, couldn't sell or buy. 
what would I be comfortable with? For me personally, I would not be comfortable with a U.S. only portfolio. Yes, the U.S. has trounced uh, the international markets uh, over the last really 30 years. There have been some shorter periods of time during that 30 year period where they haven't, notably the first decade of the century. But by and large, yeah, the U.S. markets have, have trounced international uh, markets, but I'm not convinced that that's going to continue uh, over the next 25 years. Now, it might, and I'm certainly heavily invested in the U.S. market, but I'm not comfortable with VU and chill. In fact, VU and chill would unchill me. I would be less than chilled with just VU. And for me, I want, in addition to large U.S. companies, I want smaller companies. I like the value tilt for historical reasons in part, but also because it's just consistent with my own approach to investing, particularly when I pick individual stocks. I like having a little, a little more exposure to REITs than what the S&P 500 offers, so I have a REIT fund. And again, I like international stocks, both in developed countries and in uh, emerging markets. It's what I need to have en a, a, enough diversification uh, to, to be comfortable with. For me, it's six or seven funds and chill. That's what works uh, for me because I'm not confident that U.S. large cap stocks will outperform everything else over the next 25 or so years. If they do, I'll still do just fine enough. Uh, but if they don't, well, I'll probably do okay as well. So that's a decision you have to make f for yourself. For some, VU and CHILL uh, does work, but I would caution you, don't look at just the last 10 years or so. Yes, U.S. markets have trounced international markets, but that will change. Now, will the next 30 years look similar to the last 30 years in terms of U.S. versus international? Only time uh, will tell. Uh, but my view is, as much as I love the S&P 500 uh, and the U.S. markets, I don't want to put all of my eggs in just one basket, in this case, U.S. markets. I need the diversity. So there you go. That's what VU and CHILL means, by the way. If Sometimes you'll see VTI and CHILL, which is Vanguard's total U.S. stock market. I'm not even comfortable with that approach. I do need uh, the added diversity that international stocks provide. Uh, maybe you don't. Which one will end up having a, a higher return over the next 25 years? Well, time will tell. Hey, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. And until next time, remember, the best thing money can buy is financial freedom.